But first off this morning, ladies and gentlemen, launching our event, <laughs> giving us a solid lift off, <laughs> part of the Mission Discovery team, which is running um, on campus, we'll see at the moment, we have the wonderful Sarah Murray joining us this morning. Um, we're delighted to welcome her as our first speaker. She's a senior NASA leader, former Deputy Chief of EVA, which I'm reliably informed means spacewalking, uh, robotics and crew systems on the International Space Station. She also served as Mission Support and Partnership Civil Council Executive at NASA HQ, and as well as that, Sarah, uh, Sarah is an Army veteran with a military and medical experience, including working in the emergency room while stationed out in Germany. So whilst I have pointed out that Maddie can help with any first aid in <laughs> we also have backup in the front row. So we can rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, we're in really safe hands this morning with a truly inspiring woman. Thank you very much for <coughs> showing you. Good morning. So I'm not accustomed to standing still. <laughs> I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to try something very quickly here. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. You can hear me in the back because I may move around a little bit. Uh, I've been moving a lot this morning, so it's going to be very difficult for me to stand still. <laughs> so let me say, first of all, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoy being a part of programs like this because I love to inspire. I think that we go through things in order to have that ex experience and to help others and to inspire. So I'm going to try to stay with the speaker as much as I can. But um, I had an opportunity to be inspired and I, I, I will just never forget it. And I don't know, some of you who are from India or have been to India may be familiar. There is a place outside of the Taj Mahal, Agra, and there is a restaurant there that is run by acid attack victims. And these ladies really have some stories. And I tell you, that when they can do the things that they are doing after going through what they've gone through, we can do just about anything. And anytime I go to India, I look for them. This restaurant, it's called She Rose. It's on Facebook. You guys can look that up. If you ever get out to the Taj Mahal, they're right down the street. And they all have stories. And so I just always start with that because it just inspires me. You can do anything. And you never know what others are going through. A lot of times you think you are really going through challenges. Let me tell you, it can always be worse. It can always be worse. So you just have to just push your way through. So let me just get started here, but I love these ladies. All right. So you're going to get a little bit of geography. And excuse me if I talk a little rapidly. I want to keep us on time. And then also I've been moving a little bit this morning, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to slow down. But you're going to get just a bit of geography of the United States this morning because I want to talk a little bit about where I've been and what I've done, where I was there, while I was there. So um, in the United States, there were what they call two migrations where millions of blacks migrated from the south of the United States to the northern part of the United States because the conditions were just atrocious in the south. They weren't that much better in the north, but opportunities were a little bit better in the north. So what we have here, and I think I have a pointer here. So I'm going to point out a few areas right now. So my family is from the poorest state in the country, Mississippi. And my parents took the migration. And I was actually born up north near Canada in a city called Detroit. However, I ended up in St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I grew up as a child. I'm going to point out a few more areas because I'll be speaking about them, and it'll get, it'll get a perspective about where I was. So I graduated in school from a place in El Paso, Texas. I started school in Arizona. I spent the Army, my Army time was in Alabama and El Paso, Texas. Let's see, I told you that I grew up in St. Louis. One of the jobs that I had was in Washington, D.C. I can't see it, but it's up here. Here it is. 
Washington DC is where one of the jobs that I had, and then I also have, and this is all with NASA. So I'm just pointing this out because I'm gonna be talking about some of these areas. When we launched the space shuttle, it was launched from Cape Canaveral here in Florida. All right, hopefully I've covered everything and we'll keep moving. Okay, so like I said, my parents migrated north just to get away from some of the atrocities. And, and sometimes I just like to give you a perspective. One of the things that we experienced was as a child, I may have been about four or five, I had two brothers below me, and uh, my grandparents lived in the country in Mississippi, and my dad was probably a young fellow by then, I think my children are his age, <laughs> the age when this happened, he was probably about 25 or 26, and he's got these three small children in the back of the car with him, and we're driving on a small gravel road. Only, it's a one car road, it's, you have to pull over if someone needs to get by. Well, we're driving on this gravel road, and um, this truck bumps us. And, you know, we're small kids, we just get hysterical, what's going on? And it bumps us again, and it bumps us again. And finally, when my dad gets to a point where he can pull over, he pulls over to let them by. And instead of going by, they pulled in front of him, they pulled him out of the car, and they beat him until he was unconscious. Because he was a black man, and you were supposed to pull over immediately when there's a white person behind you. And we, as small children, are sitting in the back of the car. We don't know what to do. We're just crying and screaming. And they drove off, and my dad lies there unconscious, and we sit there for probably an hour before, it's a small country, before someone else drives up and, and helps us out. So that's kind of to give you an idea, especially during that time, how bad it was. It, I, I've had cousins that were killed, and I, I don't have time to go through all of that, but what, the, the, what I want you to get out of this, hopefully, is that you see that I'm still standing. That's what I want you to get out of this. And my dad is still living, and he lives with me. So, so you can get through things is the point. So make sure, I'm gonna be telling you some mistakes that I made also, especially for some of you young people. Learn from other people's mistakes. Try not to make them yourself. So hopefully I can help you out with that. So my childhood years were spent in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm not sure if you're familiar with St. Louis, Missouri, but it's called the Gateway to the West, St. Louis, Missouri. And at that time, it was the Gateway to the West back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, it's on the Mississippi River, so anything past the Mississippi River was considered the West now. And so I was raised there. I went to an all-black school at the time. There, there were a lot of killings at the school. I, it's just amazing to me how it became just so normal for us that it didn't prevent me from learning what I needed to learn. I knew that there were teachers that got beat up. I knew that there were gangs that would come into the school and they'd kill someone and run out. But I still persevered. I was the child standing in the lunch line reading Sherlock Holmes, no matter what was going on around me. You just had to know when to duck and cover. <laughs> so, um, but I also tell people also during this time, this is where I got the basics. My foundations absolutely came from my parents. Absolutely, I can tell you that. My parents didn't have a lot of education, but my mother's voice is ringing in my head right now. And she said, well, I won't say exactly what she said, <laughs> but, but there were two things. If you are doing something, if you're responsible for something, you do it to the best of your ability, whether you like it or not. If it's your responsibility at that time, you do it to the best of your ability. The other thing that she would tell us is, well, it's something like his stuff stinks like everyone else's. It means that no one is really better than anyone else. We all have our strengths and weaknesses, but not, we're not really better than anyone else. We're just good at some things, and we're good at other things. And so uh, another way to say that is he puts his pants on one leg at a time just like you do. And so all of that, I got my basics from my mom and my dad. They worked hard. My dad had three jobs. He had a full-time job at Pepsi Cola Bottling Company. 
he worked the night shift because you get more money, the night differential, and uh, then he had his own taxi cab, and he, he took passengers, he took um, visitors back and forth from the airport, and then he had a cleaning business where on the weekends, there were five of us, five children, and we were all on the weekends out cleaning office buildings. And just a really cute story I'll tell you, when my mom passed, she passed right before my daughter was born, about two months before my daughter was born. And this is, she's in St. Louis, I was in, uh, I was in Maryland. So right after I had my child, I said, you know, I'm gonna go spend my maternity time, thank you, Craig. I'm gonna go spend my maternity time with my dad, because he was in St. Louis by himself. So he's still working, He's got to go to the office building and clean. So I had my newborn and my 16-month-old, and we went to the office buildings and we're cleaning and I'm mopping the big cafeteria. And um, one of his bosses, they come in and they said, um, Roosevelt, who's that here helping you out? He says, oh, that's my daughter. He says, you said your daughter worked at NASA. Why is she mopping our floors? <laughs> but, you know, he needed that quality time. It was just great for us, and I wanted to spend that time with him because they had been together for a long time. And I really hate that my mom is not with us now, and, and any of you that have lost your mom, I know it just never, never really goes away. It just never really goes away. So that was St. Louis. Now... When I graduated from high school, I went to Arizona State University. It's in Arizona, way out west. And they were absolutely, <coughs> I saw one other black person when I went out there. And the auditorium for orientation was just huge. And we spotted each other and just made a beeline. <laughs> this is okay, we're not by ourselves. But after a while, you get accustomed to it, especially in the fields that you're in. I don't know. If some of you are, you know, you're working moms, or you have professions, you're engineers, or what have you, you're doctors, and sometimes as women, we are the only ones in the staff meetings, or you know, in the supervisors meetings, or in the management meetings. So at some point, you just get accustomed to it. But at that point, I had just left St. Louis, and it was very new to me. So I went to Arizona State. I wanted to be a pediatrician, and so I was majoring in chemistry. However, a few things happened and it didn't turn out quite the way I expected or anyone expected because instead of bringing home my college degree, my university degree, I brought this <laughs> home and I can tell you my parents were not happy. <laughs> they absolutely were not happy. I get to school and I meet this Joe and, and then he sweeps me off my feet, I call him a Jew, but we're still married. We've been married for over 40 years, so it works out. Never now. We do have a couch. All right. So, so anyway, so this is Robert, my, my dear husband. And we have four lovely children who are all out of the house now. They range from my youngest is 24, the oldest, ooh, my oldest will be 39 this month. And I had two grandchildren. So, let's keep going. So, this Joe <laughs> convinced me to join the Army with him. So we went into the Army together. And uh, just an absolute experience, especially for young people, because it teaches you to be independent and be responsible. Because I tell you, those drill sergeants will not let you get away with anything. And when we talk to the children in Mission Discovery, we talk about how important teamwork is. You work together, you understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. You don't, you don't tease people because they can't do anything, because we all have something that we can't do, but you find out what the strengths are in your team. Well, let me tell you, teamwork in the military was a little bit different, because during that time, if someone didn't do something correctly, and the entire team, the entire unit, would be in trouble. But that night, that one person would be in trouble. <laughs> right? So we get back to the bay, and, and she might get a little beat up or something. You better get this right tomorrow. Right? So I'll, I'll give you one example was um, we, in our uniform, we're all supposed to be uniform, our green uniforms. I think I might have a picture of that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is me. This is me right here. Uh, right here. 
Jericho. And so um, we were in formation, four o'clock in the morning, you need to be there standing in formation and ready to go. And one young lady didn't have her uniform on correctly. And so the drill sergeant said, your punishment for the whole week, there are no smoking breaks. So smoking was really big this time. There are no smoking breaks. And this is how they really mess with your mind. That young lady didn't smoke. So <laughs> the smokers who are definitely gonna make sure that she did what she was supposed to do the next morning. But anyway, while I was in the military, most of my time was spent in Germany working in the emergency room. I delivered babies, did, did all sorts of things. It was just really great, and it was very helpful when it came to treating my kids. My, my, I found out one time that my child had an injury, and I said, I didn't know you hurt yourself then. Why didn't you tell me? He says, Mom, all you ever tell me is that he'll be okay. And I said, you're okay, aren't you? Right? So I was not one of those moms that rushed to the hospital all the time. I mean, they really had to have something broken and protruding before I went to the emergency room. But they're tough. They're tough. I built character. All right, so from the, from the military, I thought, oh, so what am I going to do now? I wanted to be a doctor. But by then, I had a family. My son had been born in Nuremberg while I was in the military. And um, we needed money. And the education for a doctor, I don't know about here, but it's a number of years. And so I said, you know what? I like math. Let's just do electrical engineering and be done with it. So <coughs> at the University of Texas in El Paso, I went to school to be an electrical engineer. That's where I think. I really started recognizing, before I may have been a little bit naive about racism and, and biases, but this is where I really, really found out that it exists. I had, I was in um, one of the um, academic clubs and we studied for our exams using our old exams. And so the young man sitting next to him, and it was a, because it was in El Paso near the Mexican border, it was mostly Hispanic, but there were a number of whites there, and very, I was the only black in the engineering department at that time. And so the young man, we were studying our exams, and he says, Sarah, you have the same answers I do. I says, yeah. He says, well, I had a 95. I had a 75. Our answers were the same. So naive Sarah, there was a mistake made. I know sometimes the, ins the instructor doesn't actually do the grading. Sometimes they have student helpers and graduate students. I says, I'll just go to the instructor. And, and he says, yeah, take my, take my exam with you and, and show him. So I went to the instructor and told him what the problem was. And the first words that came out of his mouth was, women don't belong in engineering. And that was it. That was it. And so I will tell you that angered me because it was, a, I thought, first of all, not realizing all the biases that are out there, I thought this man was an idiot because everyone can do anything, right? And it's, does he really think that? And then after a while, I got anger, angry. But what did that anger do for me? It just made me show him that, guess what? This woman belongs in engineering. And so uh, I did prove him wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's just another example of, it doesn't, you have to expect, you really are gonna have to expect that things are not gonna go the way you want them. So I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not gonna go the way that you want it to go and you're not the only one, and I'm not the only one. Okay, and then for a while, I graduated from UTEP. For a while, I did some teaching in Germany. When I was not in school, my husband was still in the military, so I went to join him for a little bit, and I taught in uh, Frankfurt. Let's see, so now, let's talk about NASA. Just an awesome experience. I have been at NASA for over 20 years. And I can still just get chills that I'm there, the work that I've done, and, and anyway. <laughs> so, 
So my very first job as a mission controller in mission control was to actually send commands. I push the button, I send the command to the space shuttle, and I control the space shuttle. Every system on the space shuttle, the communications, the environment system, just everything. And I thought, this is just awesome. And so we would take team pictures. You, I, I think you can find me in this one. <laughs> so, so this one you can find. And, 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 I'm, I'm, and I'm telling, I don't want you to feel like I'm telling you things because, oh, Sarah's had a hard life. Because I really do believe certain things make you stronger. And so this is not why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because hopefully it teaches you how to respond to certain things and how to get through certain things. And when I first got to NASA, uh, a young lady was showing me around the building, the facility, and uh, where, you know, where the supplies were. And two white gentlemen walked by. They looked at me. And then they kept walking and they said, <coughs> it is starting to look like the ghetto around here. And I thought, oh my gosh, this institution. NASA's a lot better now. I, I will tell you that um, I have folks that work for me, two supervisors that work for me. Um, he lives in my neighborhood with his husband with their two children. And the other supervisor, a young lady, well, she's, pro she's probably a little younger than I am. She's in her 50s. And um, we had a retreat, something like this. And I have people kind of get up and just say a little bit about themselves so that as a team, you know a little bit about each other. So she got up and said that she had been with her partner for 20 years, and they were finally passing laws where they could actually legally get married, get insurance. And when she started talking about that, she just wanted to cry. And can you imagine being with someone, wanting to marry them, and someone else is telling you, no, you can't do that, right? And so, um, so what my point is, there are probably some pockets of NASA that may still have these biases, but for the most part, we do not see them. These people are promoted, we are promoted, and we have a number of females that are doing awesome jobs. Our astronauts, you know, we have many female astronauts. And so, um, they are also inspiring. <coughs> Alrighty, so from uh, Mission Control, I did spend some time, my husband came from Germany, so I didn't tell you the story, I have to do it very, very quickly, but when I got the job with NASA, my husband had orders to go to Germany, and I thought, well, what are we going to do? And so, as young people, we thought, well, let's see how much they offer you. So, <laughs> we were naive about that, didn't know how much they offered, so they offered me my salary, and I said, bye, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so my husband went to Germany, and my son and I went to Houston, Texas. And so when he got out of the military, I, oh, sorry, I ended up, I ended up um, in Maryland, up north near um, Washington, D.C., Space and Ground Network. This network is the communications network. And so we have three to four satellites that are always orbit orbiting the Earth. And the shuttle, the space station, most of our spacecrafts use these satellites to communicate, communicate to the ground. So this was my job, was to manage these satellites and also the ground network because we had <coughs> antennas all around the world, in Africa, in Spain, in Hawaii. And so sometimes when we don't have a line of sight, when we can't communicate to the satellite, we can hand down to the ground that have satellites and still keep our communication going. So that was a really good job. And then we unfortunately had the Space Shuttle Columbia accident, a really, really, um, I mean, it's just really bad for NASA. It was our, it, it's not our second actually, we had had uh, an accident in the Apollo days and uh, then we had the Challenger in the 80s right before we got to NASA and then, um, 2003, we had the shuttle accident, and 
And so, again, as bad as it was, we learn something from it. We absolutely have to learn from these experiences. You have to take something away. And, and, and honestly, what we learned was when the space shuttle first launched, a piece of foam from something that actually holds it together while it's just standing on the, on the launch pad, it just fell off. But when it fell off, it hit the underside of the space shuttle. The underside of the space shuttle has special tiles that protect it from the heat <coughs> when it's entering the atmosphere, uh, when it's coming back. And so we did not know that that tile had been damaged. So we launched into space. Of course, space is nice and cold. There's no heat. We do our mission. It's an 11-day mission. And then we prepare to come back to Earth. And so as they entered the atmosphere, it heats up, and that tile started peeling away. And it just peeled away. And we know that we started losing pieces of the shuttle on the west coast near California. And as it just, and you know, it's going to land here in Florida. And all across the country, pieces of that shuttle was falling off. And, and I mean, just the worst thing is to know, to find the astronaut's baby picture that she took up with her. You know, when we are doing the search, we are, you know, finding as much of the shuttle as we can, and, and we found the picture of her baby. And so, one of the churches, we had two astronauts that attended that church, so that church lost two really good members. So it was just, uh, we, like I said, we did learn a lot, but it's still really hard to, to know that we work, we work as a team with these astronauts for two years before they actually launch. So when I say working, that means we're working. We're going to birthday parties. We're going to their children's you know, high school graduations or whatever. So we were more than just co-workers. And so it was really hard. Um, I won't say that part because I can't. Um, <laughs> so, after the shuttle Columbia accident, I um, went to the International Space Station. So my first job at the International Space Station was to manage the flight controllers and mission control that manage the power that powers the, the, the space station. And so if you're familiar with solar arrays, so the solar arrays are on the space station and they gather the rays from the sun, and then the space station converts those rays to power. So I managed that team. Then after that, I went to be the deputy chief of space flight training. This is where I found something else that I really, really enjoyed, which is why I'm here in Scotland, was that we have international partners. It's an international space station. So our biggest partners are Japan, Canada, we have the European Space Agency, which is comprised of the countries here in Europe, and then Moscow, Russian, the cosmonauts. And so my responsibility was to manage the training for the flight controllers and to manage the training for the astronauts. But because the astronauts <coughs> work as teams, and those teams are international teams, then that gave me the opportunity to travel to Tokyo to travel to Canada, to travel to Moscow. We spent most of our time in Moscow because after the shuttle program ended, we relied on the Russian vehicle to get to the space station. And so most of the time was spent in Moscow. And I think some of you have met Mike Fole. That's where Mike Fole and I met. That guy was hard to train, let me tell you. <laughs> 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 Great. It's great. We've known each other for a long time. And again, NASA is such a family that he is one of the reasons that I'm here because he had been, been involved. He, you know, he's from the UK and he called me and said, Sarah, I think you'll like this. And I've been coming here for five years. Five years. I can't believe it. And I do have like some fans when I come. I see some of the same people, Arena and Lily. This young lady stand up, Lily, please. <laughs> Lily. 
I met this young lady. She was the youngest young lady in our Mission Discovery program last year. And she was just awesome. Some kids are quiet. Some kids are just over the top. But mm -hmm. Lily is beyond her years. She's very mature. And thank you for being here. And turn around so they can see that NASA logo. <laughs> <laughs> for bringing her. <laughs> okay, so uh, so the next job I had was assistant division chief for EVA extravehicular activity, which is a spacewalk. And they're not really walking, they're floating, right? Mm -hmm. And robotics, robotics meaning the space station has a robotic arm that we use to move large equipment, or we may even put an astronaut on it to get it from one point on the space station to another. And so I was responsible for those flight controllers because we could do that from the ground, or the astronauts can do it from, from the space station. And the systems were up on this, the space station. Also, being responsible for the EVAs means we are responsible for their training. The best way for the astronauts to train to be in space and to do their spacewalks is to be in water. That's really the best way on Earth that we can simulate microgravity. And so my responsibility was to make sure that I, I had a facility. It's a, it's a nice, large facility. I'll talk a little bit because it's a short video. But uh, it's one of the largest indoor pools in the world. It has a mock-up of a space station immersed in the water. And the astronauts put their suits on, and um, they are put in the water and they practice whatever task that they're going to do when they're in space. Space is a very, very, very danger, dangerous environment. And so we make sure that they are well trained before they actually have to do it. So I believe we have a video coming up here. No, we don't. So Columbia Recovery, sorry, I, sorry, I forgot this was here. Very quickly, one of the astronauts and myself flew to Utah and Nevada. It's out in the west. During the recovery effort, we had lots of entities uh, helping us recover pieces. And in Utah and Nevada, they had prisoners that were helping with the recovery efforts. And what's funny is that for every day that they helped, they got a day off of their sentence. So I took a quick photo with those guys. They're really nice guys, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this is your video. We have to put them on a crane because that suit is 300 pounds. Sorry, Underwater, the safety so divers meet them and carefully remove them from the platform. Each astronaut is carefully weighted to be precisely neutrally buoyant. Hey, they don't call it the neutral buoyancy lab for nothing. Once weighted properly, the astronauts hover in the water as if floating in the weightlessness of space. Since fins don't work in space, the astronauts don't get to wear them here. They must be moved from task to task by the divers. The divers are also responsible for keeping a careful eye on everything happening. Each astronaut has four divers assigned to him or her. Two are safety divers. Another has a camera with a cable going to the control room. And there are more cameras mounted all over the inside of the pool, too. In the test director room overlooking the pool, 21 monitors keep the staff informed of everything that happens below. They oversee the safety of the operation. If anything were to go wrong, the divers can get the astronaut to the surface in only seconds. In the test conductor room, another team is conducting the training run. The test conductor and team speak directly to the astronauts through the communications gear in their helmets, but powerful underwater speakers allow the divers to hear everything that's being said, even if they can't talk back. Check out 
The point of all this effort is to provide a learning environment for astronauts where they can practice tasks over and over in simulated zero gravity before they're required to do it by themselves in space. Tasks that are easy on land become much harder in zero gravity. And harder still while wearing a spacesuit that has to be able to protect an astronaut from the vacuum of space. Okay, so what a responsibility. So, so there's more to just understanding what the activities are that the astronaut has to do in space. I have to understand that facility. You know, the temperature of the water, the cleanliness of the water, the, the water treatment system that we had to work out with the city of Houston. So it was just a huge responsibility. And then also our divers, a lot of our divers came from the Navy. If they got out of the Navy, we would, you know, they could dive, and so we would hire a lot of the divers from the Navy. So we had quite a few people that were involved in this activity. It is a huge activity. After I did that, I went to Washington, D.C. to work with the NASA Administrator. The NASA Administrator is responsible for all. We have 10 centers, 10 NASA centers in the United States. They're all across the country. So he and I, we work together, and uh, we manage those 10 centers across the way. And then also, this is responsibility to communicate to Congress and to communicate to the President. So that was a really awesome job. I, lived, I was in D.C. for a year to do that, away from my family. Uh, it was great experience, great place to visit, but I was much happier in Houston. So after that year, I returned home. And now, the job that I'm doing right now, I'm the deputy of the Orion Vehicle Systems Performance. Um, so we are building a new air, air, uh, spacecraft. Another huge team effort because we work with contractors. We have a contractor that is based in Denver, Colorado that is building a portion. We have uh, another NASA center that is in the south in Alabama, Marshall Space Flight Center. They're building our rockets that actually boost us up into space. And then the European Space Agency, we work with our colleagues here in Germany Primarily our meetings are in Bremen, and so that is just a huge effort to make sure that that all comes together. And of course it all hasn't come together yet, but I have a concept of what it looks like. This is what it will look like when it does come together, and it's comprised of an abort system that if there's a problem, the abort system yanks the astronaut capsule away from all of this fuel that could possibly explode. And then you've got the abort system where the astronauts actually reside, and then fuel, lots of fuel. All right, this is just really what I said, the different pieces of that system. And our very first, the, the next mission that we do will be what we call an uncrewed mission. It's our, our practice before we actually put astronauts on. And the plan is to launch, we'll launch from Florida, and we'll go around the Earth, fly out to the moon, come back, and then we'll end up back on the Earth. The mission after that, then we'll put our crew members on, if all of that goes okay, which I'm sure it will. So, really good, I have our nice video here now to kind of, it's a summary of all the things that I've been exposed to and the organization that I was in, we have experienced. And I think from this video, you'll see why it's just a really exciting job. And it's, it's never, you're never bored, not one day. You may be tired, but you're never bored. <laughs>
So I've taken you from when I was born to where I am today. I have not had an opportunity to just tell you everything. The next time maybe we'll just allot some more time, okay. right? Because I think, <laughs> I, I really think there are some things that everyone can talk about where somebody in here can relate. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything, I'm gonna leave you, I'm gonna, I wanna give you a chance to um, ask some questions, but um, I'll wait till you ask the questions because I think someone might ask this question. So anyway, <coughs> so you've seen, you've, I've gone from this beautiful, adorable <laughs> little girl <laughs> to the young lady, or maybe not so young now, but to, to, to Sarah Murray here. Um, I tell you, nobody can drag, and that's the way you have to look at life. Nobody can drag you down, whether it's at work, whether it's a neighbor, I, I don't know, sometimes it might be your spouse, I don't know, but, but you don't let anybody drag you down, and whatever you want to do, you figure out a way to do it, you make contact with people, and then again, remember that a lot of times you go through things so that you can help other people go through things, because you've had that experience. So you've been a great audience. Thank you so much.